Let's get it. New cut content. Amelia's past explaining the hidden details of her trial. Give it to me, Andy News. Amelia's past continues to be shrouded by quite a bit of mystery, parts of which were very discreetly scattered throughout this episode. While some of you may have noticed these subtle details, there's quite a few that wouldn't have made sense unless you read the novels, hmm. and a lot of them help to enrich the overall mystery that we're slowly unraveling. So let's do as we usually do and use this cut content to better understand Amelia's trial. Okay. Let's begin. But first. Episode 42. No ad. Journey of Memories. Covering chapters 1 and 2 from volume 14 of the light novel. Picking things up from the end of the last episode, we saw that Echidna was not impressed by Amelia's arrival. You loose she woman. She had absolutely no expectations for Amelia to overcome this trial. So it was for that reason that she didn't even want to watch Amelia challenge it. But as we saw, Amelia wasn't going to let her resolve be swayed by these words. That's it right, she is literally doing Natsuki Subaru pose, even her mannerisms, the way that she's talking. It seems more like Subaru. The quick-witted responses, sometimes the self-deprecation jokes and moving on and saying it is what it is. Like, there was a lot of dialogue between Amelia and Echidna that made me feel like, yo, is this really the Amelia that I know? No, it's a new Amelia. It's the post-kiss Puck gone Amelia, and it's looking good. Her resolve be swayed by these words. Instead, she continued deeper into this forest that had taken shape directly from the confines of her memories. Now, when Echidna had to stop to catch her footing, Amelia made the suggestion for her to go barefoot. The leaves. She even went so far as to take off her own shoes Break time. to show how helpful it could be. But the reason that Echidna was even struggling in the first place wasn't because of what she was wearing. She got no it was cardio. simply because she herself had entered the dream a bit too deeply. Huh? Enough that both her and Amelia were still capable of interacting with the environment. Too deeply? Huh. Why too deeply? Because she's more engaged in what she wants to see from Amelia's past, but the more deeper you go into these dream trials, the more you're actually interacting with objects and it doesn't just phase through you. So, in order to fix this, Echidna basically modified the settings of the world. A power unique to her as the ruler of this domain. <laughs> she just went into settings and just just fucking cranked up the opaqueness, I don't know, some different settings to let her just phase through. Or unique to her as the ruler of this domain. One that determined who could do what. Alright. After she went on to explain what this world was, Amelia still found herself confused by the prospect of it just being a replay of her memories. She was curious as to how far her level of interaction could actually go. So, she asked if the forest would get messed up if she was to go on a rampage. What? It was a question Echidna bound to be foolish yet somewhat fitting to Amelia. She, she, she thought about just like creating a blizzard in the forest just for fun. As if the people, the elves of the Elio forest getting frozen due to Amelia's berserk something before frozen bond wasn't bad enough. She wants to do it again, <laughs> but this time like with intent. But even if that was how she felt, she did still give an answer by saying it was impossible. As they were now, both Amelia and Echidna were a half step removed from this plane of existence, making it so that neither of them could interact with the environment or people within it. If she was able to do either of those things though then, that was something that Echidna said would make the trial completely different. Hmm. This was a response that made Amelia even more curious than she was before. She was now interested in knowing what Echidna meant by that. So, with another question right after the first, Echidna couldn't help but mock Amelia's ignorance. Her constant flow of questions only went to highlight her significant lack of independence. It displayed her inability to think for herself. But that's what and she is! that was the part of her that Echidna really hated. But she's getting better, right? She is getting way better and more independent as the episodes go on after that kiss. Even after being told to think about it for herself, Amelia immediately responded saying that she already did, then asked for the answer. It was a response that went to elevate Echidna's emotions to a level that very few have ever done before. She said that only Subaru and the other witches were ever capable of inspiring such deep feelings of emotion. Wow. But unlike with them, the single emotion Echidna felt towards Amelia was one of pure displeasure. Yeah, because she got fucking cucked. She wanted that contract so bad. Return by death contract would have been amazing. Echidna could do like a complete run of the ReZero world, but that was taken away from her. Well, it was never even belonging to her. Subaru said, nah, I'm good. And even from the beginning, Subaru was saying like, you're not even that hot. I prefer 
silver-haired elves and not white-haired humans. Amelia was one of pure displeasure. Now, Echidna didn't exactly mention Subaru and the other witches by name, but she did refer to them as her friends. As soon as Amelia heard this word, she pretty much instinctively responded in a way that exposed her envy. <laughs> oh, even you have friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's sad on um, two parts. First, it's rude to even assume that, meaning that, oh my god, Akinda, you have friends, right? That's kind of mean, but it's funny. And then the other part is like her self reporting that I have no friends. Like, that's so nice. <laughs> yeah, she don't got any friends. Super was kind of a friend, but it's turning into more than that now. Puck is more of like a guardian, right? Roswell, I don't think, is a friend, not at all. Rem and Ram, I don't think they really interact with Amelia to the point where it's their mate's professionalism creating like a barrier, right? They can't really have that intimate friendness. Is there anyone else Amelia sees as an equal as a friend? There really is nobody. <sighs> That's lonely. A response that Echidna couldn't help but scoff at. In any case, Amelia's failure to understand the purpose of this world led Echidna to give a much more extensive description of it. She went on to talk about how moments in life often lead to regrets, and how those regrets can sometimes take root deep in a person's heart. While she did understand that they were painful to bear, she also understood that these regrets could serve to be the foundation supporting very precious relationships. It's for that reason that each trial needs to be handled differently. The way a person's regrets are manifested in their heart will ultimately determine the level of interaction required to overcome it. Okay. So, for a case like Amelia's, Talking things over to the people of her memories simply wasn't enough. Yeah, that's why I was like, yo, these trials are kind of getting different. I thought it would all be the same. Like, Subaru had to relive that life and then overcome it. But right now, we're just kind of watching TV passively. For what? And Garfield was kind of the same shit, too. Until Frederica, like, it looked like time paused, and then Frederica and Garfield were kind of talking. They're kind of just like both observing what the real truth of the past was. She needed something more if she was going to find the answer to the trial. That's why hers is inherently different from Subaru's. Anyway, with Amelia now having a better understanding of the trial, the two of them were able to make their way to the princess room. Because Echidna seemed to already know the purpose of this tree, it made Amelia ask how much she already knew about her. Hmm. But that was a question to which Echidna didn't answer. Instead, she just decided to feign ignorance, leaving Amelia wondering just how much Echidna was hiding from her. So, with no other choice but to continue on, Amelia stepped into the princess room to commence the first memory of her past. The, princess room. the opening scene with Fortuna had left out a detail regarding Amelia's memory of her. After talking about each other's eyes, Fortuna went on to say how she really had a lot to regret. She was friend with Rem, just not shown in the anime? Did we not read the cut novel content where Rem literally says, I cannot see Amelia as someone that I like or dislike? Maybe this is post, this is like Rem's feelings post Subaru, but maybe they were friends pre Subaru, but like ever since Subaru showed up, like they are not friends. But I know the web novel content is not source material, but it's an overall draft for the light novel, but like. Based on what Rem was saying and her perspective on Amelia there, I don't know if that's really a friend, man. She began to talk about how if she had known to be kinder to a lot of people, then she- They're friends post-Subaru? Are you just telling me that in the web novel, Rem just fucking despises Amelia, but in the light novel, it's just like, alright, she's not going to. She's just gonna be okay. Wouldn't have had to rely on her brother to the very end. Ah. <sighs> Really regrets, kinder to a lot of people, wouldn't have to rely on my brother to the very end. Because, like, these elves got relocated and they're called forest dwellers now. Something is very interesting because this is a temporary residence. And this seems like Betrigus also shows some regret, right? Something happened. The elves had to relocate it. And her relying on her brother, which is Amelia's dad, that probably is the event, you know? Leading up to this? ...to the very end. It was a very vague statement given with a very lonely expression. But what was more important than the contents of her statement was the peculiar manner in which she said it. You see, Fortuna had the tendency to emphasize the word, really, 
It was a force of habit that Amelia herself adopted and continued to mimic. The only difference, though, was that Amelia didn't use it when she was sad. Instead, she chose to emphasize the word when she was happy and smiling. Aww. This was because she wanted to associate her mother's favorite phrase with feelings of joy. She wanted to separate it from the usual memories of sadness and loneliness. So this was her way of painting over the bad memories with good ones. That said, I'm sure you've pieced together that this is why we tend to see Amelia stress the word really. It was a subconscious force of habit that she picked up from her mother. Now, when small Amelia was left to herself, the reason she had never chosen to go outside before was because she knew that her mother would always come back so long as she waited. Not the biological one that was too busy to take care of her, though. But Fortuna. No. She was waiting for her second mother figure that she loved just as much. Isn't it fucking convenient that we're never gonna see Amelia's mom or fucking dad, bro? I doubt we're gonna see either of them, bro. It's fucking bullshit. All we got is Fortuna and Goose, and I'm not even mad about Fortuna, but it's just like, come on. And this fucking one backstory, like... You really not gonna give me more like it's just this fucking annoying sh mystery shit the topic keeps hiding from us, bro. It's like the one time, the fucking one time we go to see Child Amelia, no parents at all. Waiting for her second mother figure that she loved just as much. You see, Amelia actually really enjoyed the prospect of having two mothers. To imagine being cared for by another person as loving as Fortuna. How greedy was something that she really liked to think about. How sinful. So having two mothers wasn't exactly a bad thing for her. In any case, this was the time that Amelia decided not to wait. Which brings us now to the scene with Juice and Fortuna. While it was pretty much the same, the way they translated some of Juice's lines did change the context for what it implied. The first was when he was talking about his responsibility, rather than saying it was an obsession that bordered on delusion. What he really meant was that it was a compulsion turned into obsession. His lingering regrets made him compelled to follow through with his duty to the point that it became his obsession. Then, the second was when he talked about the hundred years of turmoil. That was interesting, right? <laughs> I mean, that, that's just straight up just foreshadowing about the next hundred years, which then leads into the current timeline. <laughs> no. This wasn't just a figure of speech in which he was saying Fortuna's words were enough to carry him through it. It was more like he was saying that they already did carry him through it. He was talking as if to imply that he'd already been through that century of anguish. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, like, even though there is some, you know, hints that in the next hundred years, he gonna go through them's turmoil, but he's already gone through it. So, that's a bit more context towards Juice's relation to the settlement. Aside from that... And Juice is way older. I thought that Juice is younger. But Juice is an evil spirit in the modern timeline. Fortuna is actually younger than Juice. But, I just want... <laughs> I need to know what happened before this, right? Because all we're seeing is like, we never get to see the origin event. We just see like a little bit more of past events, but without further knowledge back, it's really hard to piece on what the hell is even happening, why they had to relocate, you know, why are they forest dwellers right now? What are these regrets that you're talking about? What the hell is even the seal? Is it really the seal with Satala? I don't know. It's towards Juice's relation to the settlement. Aside from that, there was also the mention of a specific role being tossed around, one that was unique to both Archie and Fortuna. When Archie had made his entrance into the conversation, he had introduced himself as the next Guardian, okay. a position we find out he's going to eventually adopt from Fortuna. We Guardian don't exactly of... know what this role entails. Guardian of Amelia? Guardian of the Forest Dwellers? I don't know. But we do know that Fortuna did mention how Archie needed to become more dependable for it. Okay. Only after he did would she be able to entrust her precious treasure to him. Whether she was talking about Amelia or the forest itself, well, that's something that I'm Maybe sure both. we'll find out later. Maybe both. What's clear though is that the Guardian is a very important role within this community. Now, after the first memory was finished, there was a bit more to Amelia's conversation about it with Echidna specifically relating to the so-called fairy. Evil spirit! There was a mention when Subaru and Amelia met up late at night and they're talking about Amelia, E-M-F, Amelia, mega fairy. I don't know if he said that, but he mentioned fairy. And Amelia was like, yo, that's like an evil spirit. I'm like, yo, is this an evil spirit? And another thing is, there's still no Puck yet. Where the fuck is Puck? Puck hasn't shown up pre-frozen bond memories just yet, but clearly like these are the events leading up to the Frozen scene, and Puck was talking as if, you know, he already knew Amelia, so maybe Puck is this fairy, and he just, just casually looking over Amelia. 
What had happened was, Echidna first commented on small Amelia's poor character. She wasn't the biggest fan of how this child was acting. Despite having such a loving mother to care for her, she still broke her promise, left the room. This poor little child. This poor little child. I mean, <laughs> you're not wrong. She, she is committing a lot of sins, but what do you expect a toddler to do? You expect a toddler to be like a very mature person that can keep all their promises and <laughs> just be good? No, they're little fucking gremlins, even Amelia. So it's interesting how the whole promise thing, you know, spirit art users, for them, it's so important to keep promises. Subaru keeps breaking that promise. Amelia also broke promises, but Fortuna made it clear that, hey, promises are important to keep for her. She still broke her promise, left the room, eavesdropped, and even lied. It was a string of actions that Echidna found to be very distasteful, and Amelia couldn't even disagree with it. <laughs> what she did do, though, was actually give thanks to Echidna for complimenting her mother like that. Okay. Fortuna truly was a caring person. Fortuna dub. So Amelia was happy. Echidna should fucking call it Amelia's real mom and dad. Fucking deadbeats, bro. Having to have Mother Fortuna take care of them. Be that somebody else was able to acknowledge that as well. As she reminisced on all the fond memories of the person she loved the most, she also remembered the two most significant names that came after her. Juice, Fortuna. Juice and Fairy. Echidna oh, found fairy? it very ironic that Amelia chose to name this lesser spirit Fairy. Fairy. Reason being evil. that Fairy was typically a term used to refer to an evil spirit. Evil spirit. Of course, small Amelia didn't know that yet. I mean, I feel like it's still Puck, but maybe it's not. Because Puck has, I don't know, maybe Puck is overseeing, overseeing Amelia from a greater distance and we've never even seen Puck just yet, but it is interesting how this fairy led Amelia to the seal. That is kind of crazy. I mean, one of the storybooks in her room even said that fairies were gospel. good. Gospel. But the truth of the matter was that... Is the storybook a gospel? Because you're showing me an actual fucking gospel here. I'm sure it's just a random book, you know, Ananias is putting in, but in folktale, you know, fairies are good. <laughs> One of the storybooks in her room even said that fairies were good. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter was that no spirit would ever be happy when being referred to as a fairy. Really? So even if Amelia was given the impression that fairies were supposed to be these gentle and reliable creatures, it didn't change the fact that spirits hated being called that name. It's an interesting detail in the way things turned out that Echidna found to be most unexpected. In any hmm. case, the bond between- There's a very interesting thing with this fairy. And there was another spirit that was kind of like this in Frozen Bond. It was Melaquera though. That red spirit that was just baiting Amelia. It was Melaquera. Queen Amelia and this lesser spirit she fondly referred to as Fairy continued to grow. Every time she'd escape from the tree, she'd use Fairy's help to do all sorts of mischievous things. Whether it be taking people's snacks or sneaking into people's houses, Amelia was always just running around doing whatever she wanted. The thing she liked to do the most, though, was listen in on Juice and Fortuna's conversations. Yeah, and she said that they were so fucking boring in mid. <laughs> she even like, I really, I really broke the promise and ran out of my house just for this content? So boring. She found that that was the best opportunity to find out stuff about her real parents. It's not like they came up in conversation very often, but when they did, Amelia was always happy to hear about it. That said, there was a topic that came up 100% of the time. And that was the checkup on the seal the of the seal. forest. The second- The seal of the forest, right? Because when you hear a seal, you think Satala, but is it really Satala? What is this? A seal of the forest? The seal Satala? Or is this forest being sealed by that seal? I don't know. In time we see Fortuna respond to it, she actually brought up a bit more information about her role as the guardian. Not only was she responsible for monitoring the seal, but this time she also mentioned something key. about a key. Whatever that key was. There is a huge lock Apparently, on the door. Apparently it was part of her duties as the guardian to watch over it. Just like how she did with the seal, Amelia, and the forest. Now, when Amelia heard that Fortuna carried out her duties for the sake of those two, she assumed that she was talking about her parents. This was what piqued her interest in the seal. Up until now, Amelia never really paid attention to the importance of it. But because this time her name was mentioned in the same sentence as it, it made her think that perhaps her parents could be found beyond it. Perhaps they were hidden away somewhere that the seal prevented her from going. That's what she's thinking right now. Parents are beyond the seal? I don't know, where are they? Never seen them. So, if that seal was in fact somewhere in the forest, 
then Amelia wanted to know where she could find it. Okay. She wanted to see if it could bring her closer to her real parents. That's so funny how she just tried to push the door and it's like, huh, it's not falling down, weird, bye. Which brings us now to Amelia's memory of the first time she found it. One thing to note about this area is that the white surrounding the door isn't snow. It's actually nothing more than a discoloration of the world itself. What? You see, this was a sacred area exempt from the laws of the world. What? So that's why every bit of nature within it took on this pure white color. Huh? After small Amelia- Whoa, 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 what the fuck? I thought this is cold. This is not the real world. This is a separate zone that is not the same world. This is a mystical realm. The seal. I don't know. What are they hiding beyond it? Amelia's real parents? Satala? Anybody? Examining this area, we saw her come across Juice face to face for the first time ever. And it was as he was crying his tears of joy that he also said a brief line that gave us a bit more context as to why. He said that the reason for his tears was because Amelia and her people had saved him. Save me. That was the sole reason for why he was so happy. How could a toddler save Juice? She can't. Physically, like, what the fuck is she gonna do? But there's something beyond that, right? It's what Amelia represents. The existence of Amelia and her health. Somehow, her simply existing is like Juice being saved. Is Amelia supposed to be the second coming of Christ? <laughs> is Amelia supposed to be Jesus Christ that came out of the fucking cave? And it's like, oh my god, our Lord is still alive? Because the previous Jesus Christ got crucified? And Juice is like, oh, oh thank god! There's a lot of themes of Christianity and religions. I don't know. Maybe I'm too, reaching too much there. Let's take out the Jesus Christ example because I think Subaru is more of Jesus Christ where he just keeps dying for his own sins and others too, but... Amelia is Juice's savior. Juice's past is so bad that this child symbolizes Juice's hope. As long as Amelia is alive and healthy, Juice has salvation. It's hard to, like, piece in. Of course it's metaphorical happiness, but we're trying to understand what the root cause of that metaphorical happiness is. It's clearly this baby kid didn't save Juice from fucking death, no. But one could assume that Betrugius had very sad moments, depressing moments. Maybe he lost something that kind of represented Amelia before, but this new baby Amelia is now like, Oh my god, I still have meaning in my life. I don't know, but at the end of the day, Amelia's existence is like Juice's salvation. Something happened in the past, something bad, and Amelia simply being there is like, oh, thank God, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. To Amelia, this was very much a strange display of emotion, but something about it did seem to resonate with her. It reminded her of how she felt whenever she wanted to cry. Hmm. So, because this was the emotion she tied to Juice's reaction, her response became Head the pet. same as the one her mother always gave her. She felt that what Juice needed right now- If we go with this Satala reincarnation as Amelia, then this might make sense. <laughs> that Satala got sealed away. I know her body isn't dead, and in order for someone to be reincarnated, they need to be dead. But in a show like ReZero, I don't give a fuck about those rules. You could simply bend it by saying, Oh, a partial part of her soul was actually dead and was passed on and created this little Amelia. That's right. It's a small fragment of Satala. Fuck you. I don't care. It could represent something like that too. I just wonder what the specifics are. Amelia representing a second chance at Satala being alive again. I don't know. How was the warming embrace of someone's arms? Perhaps that would grant him the same happiness it always brought for her. That was her reasoning behind why she went to comfort him. Okay. So this was yet another example of Amelia mimicking the actions of her mother. Now, after that was done, Amelia went hand in hand with Juice to go see Aww. more Juniper. She decided that she could no longer hide her adventures anymore. So cute! It was finally time to tell Fortuna about what she'd been doing. Liar! So she did. This was the last scene Amelia saw before the beginning of her true trial. It was the memory of an angry Fortuna- <laughs> Right, this is all demo. We're still in tutorial land. Now the real shit starts when Regulus shows up. Raging at the both of them. Oh boy. Eventually she did come to accept the situation though. She acknowledged that this was the way things were now and started to head back to the settlement with them. When the real Amelia came to accept this as the true memory of her past, she also understood why she wouldn't have been able to do so before. You see, Puck's pact that sealed away all her memories 
ensured that even if she did meet anyone from her past, she wouldn't be able to understand what it meant to her. Instead, it made it so that there would only ever be pain and sorrow. Although this was meant to protect Amelia's heart, it also guaranteed Amelia's failure of the trial. That's why now she was able to make it farther than she ever had before. So, as the memory continued with Amelia's journey back to the settlement, the whole thing was quite literally taken word for word from the novel. The only difference that needs to be mentioned comes from the description of Greed himself. What the anime didn't show was that his very appearance was the embodiment of the color white. <laughs> yeah, I thought he was supposed to be like a very average looking dude. He literally nothing special about him, but in Reaser they dripped him the fuck out. And like, why the hell is he still the same a hundred years back? Clearly he's not a regular human. Is, is Regulus also an evil spirit? Is Regulus also possessing different bodies? Like his face, his entire like aesthetic did not change, nor did his mentality. Because, like, Betrugius is so different. He is a bishop as well, not an archbishop. That's another thing, because, like, at this... Cause like, up until this point, I was like, oh, maybe the cult of the witch is actually super, super nice. Like, they seem very decent people. They're not crazy, sharp-hooded people going down killing people, right? They're, like, chill, bringing the food to the elves. And I'm thought, oh, maybe there's like a turning point when all the churches go radical and the archbishops rise. No, archbishops always existed. Regulus exists, which implies that Betrugus right now does not have the sloth witch factor, right? In order for someone to be an archbishop, like the Echidna video, right? Is Subaru the archbishop of pride slash envy? Well, kind of, but no, because in order for that, that person must have you know, the fucking witch factor. But on top of that, the church must, like, recognize them. So it's, it's a title that Subaru is capable of doing, but of course we're not going to join that unless if it's a different if route. What is going on? Regulus is still like this. Only Goose is different. Every part of the church is crazy, but only Goose's people are, like, sane people trying to help out the elves. Why is Regulus even here? For the elves, we'll have to find out next episode. It didn't show was that his very appearance was the embodiment of the color white. Everything from his skin color to the clothing he was wearing was absolutely colorless. <laughs> okay. It was as if his very existence couldn't be affected by color at all. What is the difference between white and black in terms of a pure color? Like, um, it, it, <sighs> white reflects. Like, when, when it's super sunny outside, super hot, you don't want to wear dark clothing because, like, the UV rays and all that shit will get absorbed, but the light will reflect it. If you mix all the colors of the world, it kind of, like, starts to become more black, right? So it's interesting how this character is supposed to represent greed to want and desire everything and consume everything, yet they're, like, a blank slate. You know what I mean? White is all visible light frequency. Black is the absence of all. I'm trying to, like... Piece in like any sort of like, I don't know. I'm reaching right now. I'm, try I'm trying to associate the color white, the properties of the color white, and like how that represents Regulus's greed. Since there was no tan to his skin or hue to his clothes, you could almost compare it to the pure white that surrounded the seal. That's a very interesting comparison, right? Because this is not supposed to be the real world anymore. It's supposed to be some like different fucking witch domain. Who knows? But what would happen now? I want Subaru to like. I want someone to, like, dump black ink on him. Just a bucket of black paint on Regulus. What, what, what would happen? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that, that'd be hilarious. ...or hue to his clothes. You could almost compare it to the pure white that surrounded the seal. But that was a phenomenon that Fortuna didn't care for. Okay. All she cared about was the intruder that had stumbled into her forest. Bringing us now to the end of the episode. Yep. So, that's pretty much everything we missed so far from Amelia's trial. I'm sure a lot more of the mystery will be unraveled over the next couple of episodes. Yeah, it's, I hope we get more answers, because so far it's just, Well, it's classic research fashion, where you get the answers you want, but three more pr questions will arise from that answer, but hey, at least we're getting some fucking answers. It feels like we're definitely getting more of the ReZero secrets as we go forward. But I think it was important to highlight the subtle behaviors Amelia adopted from Fortuna. Now, before I go... If mm -hmm. you enjoyed watching this video, then be sure I to did. leave a like or comment. Yes, sir! Please go like Mr. Any News is video. Here's the video. Give him a, give him a check out his channel, but this...
episode was crazy because now we're seeing pre-frozen bond memories with Betelgeuse who is so handsome. What the hell happened to you? What, does taking a witch factor just... <laughs> is it like crystal meth? Because if he's a bishop right now and not an archbishop, you know, he doesn't have a witch factor yet. If he gets a witch factor, what is that? You take a fucking crystal meth once and you just go crazy? I'm not sure. And another thing to be worried about, right? So the fairy is important. Something is crazy is going on with that fairy, right? Oh, uh, what else is super important? The seal. <laughs> Who knows what the seal is really sealing? Is it Satala? That's the most intuitive answer. Another thing that we learned is how this area is supposed to be just like pure white, not ice or snow or cold. No, this is somehow like the boundaries of what is normal in this world and beyond it is mystic shit that we have no clue about. And somehow it's there's some comparisons with that and Regulus's outfit, but that's it from me. I'll see you next time.